Well, good morning, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants event. My name is Joe Grabowski, and I'll be your host for today. If you've been tuning in this month, you know that we have been diving deep into different STEM careers. We've been talking to scientists, to explorers, to engineers all over the world, learning about their careers, but also learning their stories, how they got there, uh, and what they're doing, uh, in a lot of cases, changing the world. So really excited for today's live event. We've got classrooms joining us from all across North America and Canada and the US. We've got a great group of camera classrooms joining us as well today. A shout out to those on YouTube. Uh, use that chat sidebar, introduce yourselves, let us know where you're tuning in from. And then after that, let's keep it just for a little Q&A action uh, with our guest today. So speaking of our guests, we are pretty lucky today to be joined by Shaw Selby. He is a National Geographic Explorer, engineer, and technologist. He's gonna be joining us live from his Maker Lab in Los Angeles, California. So he works on tackling challenging conservation issues by developing and deploying new technologies. So he's built drones for monitoring the coastlines, open source environmental gear for monitoring places like the Okavango Delta, as well as acoustic monitoring buoys in the Pacific, even uh, monitoring seismic uh, activity uh, on Canadian glaciers. So let's meet Shaw right now. He is going to give us a little rundown of what he gets up to, and then we'll probably check out a little bit of the lab space. So Shah, how are you doing today? Good, how are you? Good, good. It's great to have you joining us live today. Thanks for coming into the lab. Uh, we're excited yeah, to get pleasure. to know you a little better today. Yeah, no, I'm excited to talk about the things that we do. Um, and thank you everyone for joining. I'm I'm very, um, I'm looking forward to kind of sharing with you uh, what I work on. So um, as you heard, my name is Shaw Selby. I am a conservation technologist, which I'll kind of explain what that means. It's um, a job that I basically, uh, when I first started to want to do this job, that job didn't exist. So I kind of uh, created a job that I wanted to do. Um, and it's become a career that I've been working on for um, over 12 years now, doing all sorts of really fun and exciting stuff all over the world. So I'm going to I'm going to share with you some stories about that right now. Let me just share my presentation. Um, yeah, so a lot of the stuff that I do, I like to call wild engineering because it's engineering and technology, but it's only in the wild spaces on this planet. Um, so when you know when I was growing up, I always was really interested by technology uh, and and uh, how to build different things. All my science fairs, you could see I did a science fair um, when I was a kid around um, satellite dish control systems and it kind of. Uh, was was very interested by anything technology related, especially space. And that actually led me to my first job, which was as a um, spacecraft propulsion engineer working on satellites. Um, and uh, I did that for over 10 years. Actually, in that rocket that you see behind me right there, there's one of my satellites. That one, unfortunately, exploded when it was taking off, so it didn't actually make it up. But there's um, 12 satellites that are currently going around the earth that I was the lead propulsion engineer for. Um, but in 2013, I became a Nat Geo Explorer and it was around research that I started doing around how we can take and develop new technologies and bring them into conservation. So I, I ended up starting a nonprofit, a lab that I'm in right now, but this is a picture of it where we build, develop, uh, test, deploy technologies, and then we take them all over the world. So we have a lot of things like 3D printers and laser cutters, and we can build electronics. But at the same time, my lab has things like kayaks and ice axes and expedition gear and all sorts of fun stuff. Um, and that has allowed us to do work in the Amazon, on glaciers, uh, in, in many parts of Africa, all over the world. Um, the things that we work on are conservation related only. So things like how we stop wildlife crime, how do we mitigate the impact that humans have on the world? How do we help scientists understand the world better uh, through better tools? And then how do we stop the in industry from, from um, having negative impacts on, um, on conservation? 
Uh, everything we do is open source. So that means anything that I build here in the lab, you guys can build. I, I put all the designs, I put all the code, I put how to build it, the instructions, everything on the internet for anyone to copy what we're doing. And I do that so that we could just get better at conservation across the world. Um, and then all the data that we collect is open. So that means that we want anyone to be able to access this sort of data and understand it and, and kind of be able to share that with the world. Uh, and I do a ton of, of work with students, uh, lots of STEM outreach. So we build things and we deploy them. This is up in the Bay Area in California where we deployed some sensors, some field kit sensors, which I'll um, explain more about shortly. So some of the different things that we work on. Uh, one example that you had just heard earlier was drones. I started working on drones before they were popular things that you could buy in any store. You know, when I first started working on them, you had to build them from scratch uh, if you wanted them to do that. And that's actually the, the first grant I got from the National Geographic Society was how we can take drones. Actually, at that point, it was how we could take remote controlled airplanes, turn them into drones, and then have them watch over our coastlines and monitor our coastlines. And so that work's taken me all over the world to do some really exciting stuff. And I'll tell a couple stories about that um, right now. Um, the most recent drone work that I did was, was in Sri Lanka with um, a, a very close friend and another Nat Geo explorer named Asha DeVos. Um, and she studies these big, beautiful blue whales in that area. And so she asked me to come and help to, to use drones to, to better monitor these whales. And so this is a picture I took for my drone of a blue whale as it came up. We could tell the size of the whale and how healthy the whale is. Um, that part of Sri Lanka has had a lot of activity in terms of fishing and whale watching. And so we wanted to kind of better understand those impacts. There's Asha right there flying one of the drones that we brought and left in Sri Lanka um, for her team to end up using uh, to, to continue this work. Um, this is a video of some, some pilot whales that we saw. And you could see, you know, as I'm following these whales, you could see one of the whale watching vessels come up and 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 pass right in front of the whales. One of the the goals of this work is that maybe we can we could help protect the whales from maybe more aggressive fish whale watching vessels or other sorts of stuff. But but that's all um, that's all the fantastic stuff that Asha does. And I just came trying to bring in a new technology to help her do her job better. That's that's a lot of what I end up doing. Um, another project that I worked on that involved drones was in this country in Central Africa called the Republic of Congo. So the Republic of Congo has some um, really nice protected areas. One of the protected areas that we were working in was called Odzala National Park. And Odzala National Park is really important because it has a very healthy population of Western lowland gorillas. So this is a photo of a gorilla that I took when I was in Odzala. Um, the, the researchers there, they study these gorillas because they want to understand their behavior. And one of the weird behaviors that they have in this area is these gorillas really enjoy eating the specific part of a root of a tree. And, and the reason why researchers are interested in this is because this is not a natural thing that gorillas do. This is a behavior that one group of gorillas has learned. Um, and then since taught to other groups of gorillas. And so they've put up all these camera traps to try and understand how that knowledge is passing from one gorilla group to another gorilla group. And it's really interesting because, you know, we think about how knowledge passes from one human group, from your teacher to, to you guys, or from your parents to you guys, and how that kind of uh, radiates outward and then everyone becomes more knowledgeable. Well, the same thing happens in gorilla groups and um, the partners we have in the field are trying to better understand that stuff. But one of the things that's hard is it's in a jungle. The jungle is very dense. It's hard to get around. And so they don't really know where all these trees are that the gorilla likes to eat the roots from. And so they brought me in to fly drones. What we were doing is we would fly the drones over the rainforest and we would map that rainforest. And then we could take that map and put it into software and actually be able to look at it and find those individual trees. Mm -hmm. And then that will help them then take uh, new camera traps and put them in these new places and actually track how far that knowledge has spread. 
it's a really cool project. And so we're continuing to work with them to, to figure out how to do that. And then also bring in sensors and other sorts of equipment so they can better understand it. Um, and so this is, you know, back when we were doing there, we were doing some, some engineering in the field and you could see, we use a big leaf as our desk <laughs> to do some, uh, to, to do some engineering. That's the fun thing about conservation technology is you really got to make things work with what you have around you. Um, you don't always have all the tools um, that, that you're used to and things like Amazon aren't around to get you overnight delivery of things that you might've forgotten. So it's a lot of problem solving all the time. It's a lot of fun. Um, this is one of the gorillas that, that I saw when I was there. It's really quite amazing to be uh, in the company of these animals. We were, I remember at one point we were walking with one of the guides through the rainforest and it took us about 45 minutes. Uh, and then he stopped us and he didn't speak any English. And so it was very difficult to communicate with him, but he stopped us and he told us to be quiet with his finger and then kind of showed us around. Uh, and next thing I knew, I was surrounded by a group of 30 gorillas in every direction. And I didn't see them at first. And it wasn't until we got quiet and we stood there that we could kind of see them. So these are really amazing animals and we have to protect them. Um, other projects that we work on is how we can build uh, tags to help with animal tracking. So we've done some of that with, with whales before. We've done it with, with, with other animals. Um, and we're always trying to help to create these better tools. One of the problems in this space is that these tools are very expensive. And so a, a, a tag um, from a company that makes these tags that you put on an animal can cost as much as $7,000. Um, and what my lab does is we come and we figure out how to make that same tag, but make it for $100 or $200 so that we can put out more of these things and understand more information about how these animals live and what they do and how to better protect them. Um, so one of the things that that has been my main focus in re recent years is how we build better, cheaper sensors. And so um, sensors help us understand the world around us. They, they give us the tools to see how things are changing in our climate. They help us understand weather and water quality and air quality and all these things that are really important, not only for animals, but also for humans, just to be able to kind of um, be able to kind of live in a clean and, and safe world. Um, so one of the things that we've been working a lot on right now is our own project called Field Kit, which is a set of tools, a set of sensors that allows anybody to kind of explore the environment around them, all open source. And so that includes a website that allows you to kind of click around and dig into that information and map it and do all sorts of fun sort of stuff um, from that. We built an app that allows you to kind of interface and stuff, and then the and then hardware um, uh, sensors themselves, which I'll show you after I'm done with this presentation. Um, we have actually been working with lots of partners to deploy FieldKit all over the world. So one of the projects we've been working on is uh, is called this is called Citizen Science for the Amazon with the Wildlife Conservation Society, putting these FieldKit sensors all over the Amazon. So in in you know five of the seven countries that make up the Amazon basin. Uh, installing these sensors and allowing uh, the, 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 the communities there to understand how their weather is changing over time, how water quality is changing over time, how the floods are impacting as they come in and out and how that changes over time. And, and they take that and they combine that with information about, you know, how many fish they're catching and other observations that they're seeing to really understand how the Amazon is changing over time. We also have have a project with the American Prairie Reserve and the Smithsonian. The American Prairie Reserve is a really neat uh, project that's actually very closely affiliated with National Geographic, where basically they're trying to, to take uh, farmland that's no longer in use in the greater Yellowstone area, mostly in Montana, and, and rewild it into these, these areas that can be um, prime habitat for buffalo, for sage grouse and pronghorn and a lot of the really amazing species that live in this area and so we're we're deploying sensors with them field kit sensors throughout their um their reserves uh, and then the, the last project that i'll talk about uh, somewhat briefly is this one it's actually the last expedition i went on before everything shut down for covid um, and it's to central africa again it's, a, it's this country called cameroon so cameroon um, has these protected areas as well. And we work specifically in this protected area called the Jaw Reserve in, in Southern Cameroon. Um, and we're, we partner with UCLA on this. They're really trying to study um, this, this plant that you can see in this picture here, which is, which is called ebony. It's an ebony tree. Um, ebony is, if you've ever seen 
that very like very dark, almost black wood that's sometimes on pianos or guitars. That's that's called ebony, and and it's a very kind of um, very old wood. Like when you cut down an ebony tree, the dark parts just right there in the middle, so you have to let it grow for a long time. And Cameroon is trying to be very sustainable about how they do their ebony, and UCLA is helping them understand that. But this area in the Jaw Reserve, there's a lot more things that they're trying to understand. They're trying to understand that the biodiversity is in that's in this area. So all the animals that live in that area and how those are changing over time. And so here's a picture from inside of a camp that we, we, we stay at this camp. You have to hike 30 miles into the rainforest with all your stuff on your back and, um, and bring it into this camp. And, you know, you're secluded from everything. You're just right there in the middle of the rainforest. And so we would end up kind of going from this, this research camp to deploy these field kit stations and, um, and a, and, and a radio network. So here's us deploying one of the field kit stations. We want to try and understand a lot of things that's happening in the jaw reserve, including the weather, which you see this is a weather station, but there's a lot of other stuff that we're working with researchers to measure using field kit. And then the other thing we're doing is we're putting up a radio station, a, a radio network through that entire reserve that will allow you to kind of take these sensors and then bring back their data real time. And so here's um, here's uh, w one of the people who work with me, Jacob, up in the up in a tree. He's actually 20 meters up in a tree, so he's very high up in a tree installing this radio network. So here's a picture. You could see how high up in the tree he is as as we're installing these things to to gather this data and then bring it back and post it on the internet live, so anybody can actually see it and understand it. Um, so we're going back to Cameroon soon. That's going to be as soon as um, we can kind of travel again. Um, so I'm going to show you some technology, but first I'm going to leave you with three very quick lessons that, that I, I want you to kind of think a lot about. One is um, find what you're excited about, what you're passionate about. You know, for me to become a conservation technologist, it was I was passionate about technology and I wanted to help conservation. I was very excited about helping conservation. So I found a way to combine these two things that were usually very different and turn them into a new job. And you could do the same thing. And it doesn't have to be technology. It could be if you're passionate about art, if you're passionate about activism, anything, you could take that and you could take the other things that you love and put them together and, and create your own career like I did. Um, one thing to be very important is is to always be learning. I, I, I still to this day, I'm constantly learning, always trying to um, improve my skills, become a better engineer, become a better speaker, become, you know, just a better conservationist, all these things. But it's just the, the learning doesn't stop when school start stops. It's, it's something that you do for the rest of your life. Um, and then the last thing I'll leave you with is just to kind of keep on exploring. Um, there's a lot of exciting stuff to do in this world. And everybody who's listening to me today, we need your help to make this planet a better place. We need your help to do um, some of the things that this planet, I dire really, really needs. And so please help us um, to do that. Let me actually stop sharing. Um, hi, everyone. Um, I'm going to show you just a couple real quick things, and then we can go on and talk about uh, qu uh, any questions that you might have. So here's like one of the field kits that we've built. This is a board that we we built here and we designed here. You could plug all different type, sort of sensors into it. So I'll show you one right here in a box that we also designed and built. So if you open this, you see a field kit inside of there. Um, it's got a battery. This thing has GPS. It has Wi-Fi. It has all these things that you might have heard about before. But it allows you to plug in these different types of sensors and monitor things. So this one right here has a water temperature sensor, but you could do air quality. So if you want to know how smoky things are, you can combine them and add all different things. So one of the things we're going to do is like if you want to build a field kit that helps with the wildfires in California, maybe you want to know you know, you're going to put a fire sensor there and a temperature, a smoke sensor and temperature sensor and all different things. You can build your own and configure it however you want. And then you just go and you put this out in the world and it does all the monitoring for you and it comes back and it helps you um, do stuff. You can also kind of make things that that gather data as you move around. So I put a couple of these field kits inside of this box. And as I as I as I move around, it takes temperature data and my GPS and I can look on a map as I'm traveling around and then we have other projects so like here's a project where we're building a tracker that goes inside of a water bottle so i 3d printed this this uh lid that allows me to put some electronics on it and then we put it inside this and we can we're, we're actually deploying these with a school in sacramento 
where you could put it inside in, in a waterway and allow it to travel down and see how trash travels through the ocean. And then you just pick it up before it goes in the ocean and you get this really interesting insight that you couldn't have had without technology. So um, it's a lot of fun, the stuff that we do. And it's, it's, it's a lot of ex adventure and traveling around the world. And, and hopefully some of you guys um, are inspired by this and maybe become conservation technologists later on in your lives. So thank you. All right. Awesome as always, Shaw. It's great to see some of those amazing projects and where they've taken you around the world. Um, and you know what I love and I hope inspire students too is that your career didn't exist before. Uh, and you know, you found something you're passionate about and you found a way to make it, you know, make it yours and a whole new field opens up for other people to follow in your footsteps. So that's pretty darn cool. Yeah, it's exciting. I mean, when I when I started calling myself a conservation technologist, I don't think there was another person in the world that was using that phrase. And now I see giant, you know, I see um, universities opening up conservation technology, faculty positions. There's big organizations like National Geographic or the World Wildlife Fund that are hiring conservation technologists now. So it's become a career and we're really building this into something that allows a lot of other people to come in and, and do good work. Yeah, awesome. Well, we're getting lots of questions coming in via the chat. So uh, just a reminder to the students and educators on the chat, let's keep it to questions now so I can find them easier. And then we're going to start visiting some of our camera educators and classrooms too. But the question that's come up a couple times on the chat, uh, uh, Shaw, is about how you can make those sensors so much cheaper. Is it, um, you know, is it just that you're using different parts? Is it, and, and then they're also wondering, does it lose some quality to use maybe different parts? That's a really good question. Um, you, you know, we're allowed to make things a lot cheaper because of actually one real, one big thing, this, the smartphone. So the smartphone has changed the electronics industry in the, in, since when the smartphone came out until now, parts, all these parts that become part of a board. So if you look at all these like chips and, and all this stuff right here, this stuff has gotten very cheap, very easy to build. And a lot of the people who were previously building animal tags or sensors, we're building it on the old technology. And so what we do is we come in and we use this new technology to build the same thing and it, it allows us to do it a lot cheaper. Um, sometimes that means that the quality is not the same, but one of the things that that the people who work for me and you know my organization try to do is how do we build something that has the same amount of quality, but you know, is in this cheaper package. And so that's a big focus of the work that we're doing. And there's a huge amount of opportunity to do that. All right, awesome. Well, let's get meeting some of our crew. So not too far from you uh, in California with some grade four fives hanging out with Mrs. Shelton. Let me bring uh, her into the call. Hey, Mrs. Shelton. Good morning. Hi. Good morning. Um, so one of the questions my students had was, how do you choose which projects do you work on? There's so many different organizations and, and things to do out there. So how do you make those decisions? That's a really great question. Um, you know, with conservation, there is there are so many things that need to be worked on. Um, and so the way that we usually do it is every project we take on, we partner with an organization that's already working in that area. So, you know, an, another nonprofit that's in the rainforest, working with communities, trying to solve these sort of issues. And then we come in to, to help them build the tool that they need to do their job better. Um, and so, you know, we do get a lot of different people who constantly come to us and say, hey, we want to do this. Hey, we want to do that. And and usually the, thing, the, the deciding factors are, one, is it an area that we've wanted to work on for a while? Is it an area that we have um, expertise in? Or we would like to maybe learn that expertise in. Um, that's another thing. The third is like, you know, is there funding available to be able to do that? You know, the world runs on money. So we have to have um, funding to be able to kind of work on these sorts of projects. We're a nonprofit. So a lot of the funding we get comes from organizations like the National Geographic Society or other foundations. Um, and that kind of allows us to explore these things even further. So it's some kind of combination of, of the three of those. Part of what we're trying to do with FieldKit was create something and put it out in the world so that other people can now take that and then start their own project. So it's something that we don't have to necessarily be so involved in from an engineering perspective. We're just building this product and kind of putting it out in the world. And then people who have, have amazing ideas can go and do stuff with it. Actually, uh, last year for, for Earth Day, uh, it was the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. And we, uh, we gave away 50 field kits. These are 
full water quality testing field kits or full weather station field kits to, to, to 50 projects all over the world. And we're, we're starting to ship them out right now. And those are going to go to 26 different countries. So there's 26 different countries that have uh, 50 projects that are going to be actually deploying field kit and using them to better understand protected areas or the impact of industry and all sorts of different stuff. So it's really, really cool. All right. Awesome question to get us started from our crew in California. And Shah, there's a very popular question uh, multiple students are asking right now. They want to know, why did that satellite explode? Why did the rocket <laughs> not make it? Yeah, that's so um, sometimes that happens. That's part of being uh, in the space industry. That one specifically exploded because there used to be a, a company that's no longer around that would launch satellites from an old oil rig. So they took an oil rig, you know, those those things you see out at sea that that drill for oil, and they made it so it can move. So it turned into basically a giant boat. And that boat was the platform that they would put the rocket on. That picture that you saw behind that platform was that oil rig. And, and they would sail it out to the equator and then launch from there. What happened in that time was there was this metal shield that went under so that all the fire that came out of the rocket would shoot sideways. And that metal shield fell off. And so it didn't, it didn't move the, the, the heat in the way that it was supposed to move the heat. And so when the rock, the rocket started to come up and then it went straight back down and then the whole thing exploded. So, um, that, that ended up after that happened, the company went out of business and <coughs> they don't do that anymore. Excuse me. All right. Well, there are lots of students very curious about the cause of the explosion. Uh, we're going to bring in Mrs. Spencer. She's got her grade sixes. They're from Georgetown, Ontario, here in Canada. Hey, Mrs. Spencer, how are you? Oh, I'll just get you to unmute for me, Mrs. Spencer. Sorry. No worries. A lot of students uh, that are very interested in what's happening. We've been we've been learning a little bit about um, structures and mechanisms this year. And uh, so we have some questions. I'm going to, I was hoping to share my screen, but I think, oh, we're going to try that. So I have, uh, hopefully you can see some of the students and uh, they're going to just raise their hand if they'd like to ask a question and unmute. Okay. Yeah. So, I see them now. Hey, everyone. So, Emma, do you have a question? No. Okay. You had your hand up. Sarkis. You'll need to unmute. Yeah. Yeah, loud and clear. Okay. Um, do people not follow your rules in respecting the environment? Um, uh, yeah, that, that's <clears throat> that's a good question. I I think that's part of what we do when I said early with wildlife crime or industrial impacts is that uh, in a lot of the projects that we're working on, we're trying to put a sensor out there to better understand what happens when people don't do what they're supposed to do around the environment. So wildlife crime is when people go and poach animals, illegally kill animals when they're not supposed to. And so how do we stop that from happening? <clears throat> there's a couple ways. One, these areas usually have rangers that can monitor this stuff, but there's only a couple of rangers for a very big protected area. So if we can build technology that helps those rangers watch over the areas that they're not in, that's one of the things that we we, we do a lot of. So so yeah, that, that's a big part of being a conservation technologist is like, how do the, the tools you create help to stop the things that people aren't supposed to do in these areas? All right. Well, Mrs. Spencer, while your crew is still up with us, why don't uh, we grab another question from them? Uh, Riley, go ahead. How do you make a drone? Yeah, that's uh, that's a great question. Um, <clears throat> so now you know we live in this time where it's very easy to buy drones, but um, but one of the early drones that I had, you can see right up there, it's on the wall. I've actually made a bunch. There's other ones that are around here that I've made. Um, this that one was one that was made by a company, but. Um, they have these remote control airplanes and the remote controlled airplanes or remote controlled helicopters have motors on them and they allow you to kind of control them using a, using a, a, a remote control. 
when you want to turn it into a drone, what you have to do is you add an autopilot, like a, it's a circuit board that you, allows you to kind of program in these different things. And once you put that autopilot on that, on that drone and connect it to all those same motors and control surfaces, then you can end up programming the way that you want it to fly into that autopilot. And it just takes off and it does that sort of thing. So that's how I, I was doing it in the past. The, <clears throat> that first Nat Geo grant was, was, uh, was ha explaining how to build these things. It was an instruction manual on how to build these things. And the crazy thing was that technology moved so fast that when I first started uh, that grant, it only made sense to, to build your own drone. And by the time I was finished with that grant, there were so many drones that you could just buy off the internet that like I wrote this like 200 page instruction manual, manual on how to build your own drone. And then at my conclusion at the end of it was just, there's so many drones out there. Just go out and buy one. Don't build it. You know, you don't have to do this unless you have very, very complicated requirements and you have you want it to do all these complicated things. There's no need to build them nowadays. You can you can buy fantastic ones uh, just off the internet. All right, great questions from our group in Georgetown. Let's bring in some fourth graders from Calgary, uh, Alberta. How are we doing today, Miss Hotter? Good. How are you guys? Good. Good. Um, one of the questions my students had was, what's what's one of the most interesting things you found in your projects? That's a really good question. Um, I, you know, the, from an interesting standpoint, I really like the the interactions with with wildlife. That's the thing that like gets me very excited. So I've seen some really really cool stuff. Um, I was on an expedition in Botswana years back and I saw there was this was one of the first times I went to this area and and you know we we're traveling through the 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 delta on these canoes and I remember <clears throat> for so, you know for days and days we were like surrounded by papyrus and it was kind of hard to see things we'd hear um, elephants or we'd see hippos here and there and I remember when we turned the corner one day um, we got to this floodplain and I just had never seen so many animals in one place it was like it felt like you were in the middle of, of, of the Lion King or something, a Disney, Disney movie, you know, 60 elephants, thousands of birds. There was a lechwe and hippos and everything just absolutely surrounding us. And, you know, being getting to these places that are just that wild and pristine and preserved. I think that's the most interesting thing that I've, I've, I've seen through the work that we do is, is that there's still parts of this planet that humans haven't, messed up yet um and that we can kind of if the better we work towards protecting these places the more opportunities other people have to have these these really cool kind of experiences um uh out there um so i i think it, you know it, it, even big and small i remember one time i was hiking through the rainforest and i sat down and turned my head and i saw this really kind of interesting sort of fungus that that um that actually um, goes into an ant and takes over the ant's brain and, and it causes the ant to climb up onto a, a leaf or a, or a plant and then turns the ant into a zombie. And once it gets up to the top, the fungus grows out of the ant and kills the ant, but then, and then releases its spores and those spores come back down and land on other ants and it keeps on doing the same thing. And I, I just randomly sat down in the rainforest and looked over and there was one of those ants right there. So I took a really cool picture of it, but it's really cool to be able to see these sorts of things, big and small uh, in, in, in out in the wild. All right, very cool. We're gonna bring in another classroom here. They are in the classroom. Uh, there it is, Mr. Hoyting's group. They're great seven and eights uh, from Mariposa. Let me bring them in here. There we go. How are we doing grade seven eights? All right, can you unmute for me? We just, uh, we have you on mute, we can't hear you. Perfect. Perfect. All right, we had you for a second. There we go, got you now. Perfect. We have a student here, Erica, who would like to ask a question. Yeah, go for it. When you go on a trip, do you choose who comes with you and how do you choose? Uh, Erica's question was even, uh, uh, what about your family? 
Yeah. Uh, yeah, that, that's a great question. Um, sometimes my family has come, but but the majority of the trips that the expeditions that we go on are very difficult. So, you know, we have to like put all our gear on our back and hike into the middle of the rainforest or climb a glacier or do these sorts of things that, you know, I, I have a I have a daughter, but she's only three years old. So she's not going to do that sort of stuff because it's too dangerous. Um, but but sometimes they come on the things that are, are less dangerous. In terms of who we pick, who comes with us, it, it ends up being, it's always got to be, uh, you know, people from my team that understand the technology. So it's like somebody who is really good at, at the hardware, you know, building these kinds of things. And usually somebody who's really good at the software. Um, and then somebody who's really good at like, being able to deploy these things. So I usually come because I have a lot of experience in putting these different things into different areas and I can kind of figure out stuff as we run into problems so that we can kind of succeed. Uh, and then we always are there with our partner. So I said, we always partner with somebody who works in that area. And so that's like, uh, you know, the, the experts in conservation that are helping us th through sorts of things. Um, last thing is on some expeditions, we need, uh, we need like, additional support so you know when we travel to some places that may be more dangerous we have to have a ranger with us because it you know if we come across some kind of dangerous situation those people usually have guns and they're kind of protecting us or if it's like a dangerous from a physical sort of thing so you know when we do the work that we do on glaciers so we work in banff um, national park up in canada we work on glaciers we have a glaciologist that comes with us that understands you know, ice safety and how to kind of make sure that nobody's falling into crevasses or anything like that. So, so like we do some training uh, when we need to do training from a safety aspect um, and then usually bring that per bring that person along with us. So that, that story I shared with you guys about Cameroon, where we were climbing really high up into trees, you know, uh, like this is, you know, five stories, six stories up, like a six story building up into these trees. We, uh, we had an expert with us who um, is an expert tree climber and, and helps us put all the gear on and get everything ready so that when we're climbing up it, we're safe. All right, let's grab another question here from another one of our camera classrooms. This time we're gonna go to uh, Coniston, Ontario, some fifth graders uh, with Mrs. Loiselle. Let me bring her in. How are we doing today? All right. Uh, great. We're from Sudbury, Ontario. Well, that area, anyhow. So uh, one of my students wanted to ask, how long does it take to build one of those field kits? Um, yeah, that's a great question. So <clears throat> anybody can build it if they want. Uh, it's going to take you a little while because you have to get like, you know, all these all these tiny little parts. And then you have to put them on um, on the circuit board. You have to get a circuit board, you put them on, and then you heat it. So some people heat it in like their toaster oven <laughs> uh, to get this these things to stick in place. So, but we have we have equipment that builds these things for us. So kind of ex somewhat expensive equipment that allows us to build it. So we could build a bunch of them. We could build you know uh, like I don't know fifty of these full stations in a day or in a week um, that can that can go out different places. But if somebody wants to build it themselves you know, maybe it could take them uh, a couple of days to put the whole thing together. Now, if you want to buy it pre-built, like if, uh, you know, we're, we're pre-building these things. So if somebody wants to take it, you can, you could just get those things and you could put it together in an afternoon. So, you know, you just have to kind of plug things in and screw things in so that they sit inside of the case and everything. And then there's some settings. So you'll use the app and you can connect it and you say, I want this thing to take readings every five minutes and he, I'm going to take a picture of it and, and put it with it. And, and so you could kind of do that. The, we built this thing so that if you just want to take it and put it there, like you could get it up and going in, you know, in half an hour or something like that. All right. We have one more class to visit here. We're going to go to, uh, let's see, Miss Backer's crew hanging out with us, fifth graders in San Diego, California. Let's bring her in. There she is. How are we doing, Miss Becker? Good morning. Good morning. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, good yeah. morning. Oh, 
perfect. Good morning. Uh, lots of questions surrounding uh, technology. First of all, most of us are virtually and have been. So if our technology is not working in our city, how are you getting it to work in these rainforests? And then along along with that technology question, the students wanted to know about coding. Is there a certain coding system that you use that's more universal now among conservation technologists? Yeah, those are great questions. Um, one is, you know, with with the technology side of things, we we usually try and make things as simple as they can be and still get us the information that we need. And so we don't actually have to deal with a lot of the things that technology in cities has to deal with. You know, when you're in a city, there's all these Wi-Fi networks, there's like interference everywhere. And, you know, when you're out in, into in the wild, there's nothing there. It's just that one piece of technology. So it really just needs to run well on its own. And, and that's what a lot of our work is kind of focused on, it running well on its own. So that when we put it out there, we can trust that it's just going to work and we don't have to worry about it. Um, and, and so that's kind of, we're, we're lucky in that. We don't have to have it interface with a bunch of different things like you had to with your home technology or technology um, in cities. Uh, and then this, the second question was... Uh, uh, coding, is there like a universal oh. code? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the, uh, learning to code is is a wonderful thing. I hope everybody like goes out and does that because it's super helpful uh, moving into the future. I think a lot of the stuff that that I've seen that's really popular now, and and both in the the kind of the maker hacker space. So if you want to just like get little technology and, and turn it into you know an LED light for your for your jacket or like all sorts of different stuff, is 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 Python. Python is a really good language to learn. Um, cause they have Python now that can run on these little, diff little things, or you can get it to, to do stuff on the internet and like all sorts of stuff. So, so that's probably one of the more popular ones. If you want to just get started uh, learning coding and, and how to deal with hardware, there's a couple of tools that are really, really easy and accessible and, um, and geared towards education. And so that's things like Arduinos and Raspberry Pis, these, 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 two different tools are really popular. And so they're a great way to kind of get started. When I started conservation technology work, the first sensors that I put out there were powered using Arduinos and Raspberry Pis. So we've we've moved on to, to designing our own things, which is like a lot more kind of down the line. But the very first starting point, if you were to get these sorts of things, it's the same sort of stuff that we started doing was these Arduinos and Raspberry Pis. And the, and, and, there's just a huge community of people willing to help you with those sorts of stuff, which is really amazing. Python's really big in the Raspberry Pi world. And then Arduino has its own language that you can kind of learn. But the great thing about coding is it's like a language in that you, you learn how it's structured. And then when you want to learn a new language, it's not a huge jump. It's not like learning a language for the first time. It's just like, oh, okay. Like if you were no English and you're going to learn Spanish, you start to understand, oh, oh, this word in English is this word in Spanish. It's sort of the same way with coding in that you're like, oh, this is how I do this function in this language. And this is how I do this function in this other language. And so just getting that first base knowledge of coding is really important. All right. Great questions. We'll squeeze in a couple more. Um, building on that question from our crew in San Diego, uh, this is from online, one of our online uh, classrooms. They're wondering, what environment was the most challenging to deploy one of uh, your sensors? That's a really good question. They're all very challenging um, for in their own certain way. So we've done a lot of stuff in the in the oceans. Oceans are hard because uh, you know there's no communication systems out there, so you can't really worry. You know, hope for cellular networks or Wi-Fi or anything like that. The salt water is the absolute enemy of electronics. Because if, if electronics get wet with salt water, then the salt crusts on there and you, you end up like shorting things and all sorts of stuff. It basically kills all electronics. Um, and uh, and so so I'd say the oceans, the weather can be really bad and the oceans are really bad. I've lost drones to the oceans and all sorts of different stuff because it's, it's really hard. Um, otherwise, like, you know, we as a, as a job put these things in very difficult uh, situations. We put electronics in swamps or in rainforests that get a huge amount of rainfall um, or in glaciers that have huge temperature swings. And so a lot of the work that we have is on how do we build something that can protect these things for, for a long period of time? Um, and we try the best we can, but but there's always things that you can never expect. You know, we built a bunch of buoys that we took to the Amazon rainforest and we put in the Amazon River 
and some of them just disappeared because the Amazon River, uh, that ha- that system, that basin flows more water through it than any, uh, any other system in the world. And so there were some places that we worked in that the water, the change in water level would change from the dry season and the wet season, 50 meters. So like that is just a humongous amount of change. And when some when the water changes that much, the debris you have flowing through these rivers isn't just leaves and sticks. It could be giant trees. And these giant trees, if a giant tree or a big elephant comes at your your little sensor, who do you think's going to win? Not not the sensor. <laughs> the giant tree or the elephant's going to win. And so we've had stuff like that happen in the past. Um, and there's only so much you can do to try and try and avoid it. All right. Let's bring in our crew in Alberta, see if they have one more question. Yeah, I've had lots of questions. Um, another good one was, what's the biggest project that you've worked on? That's a really good question. Um, I, you know, I would say that Citizen Science for the Amazon is probably the largest project from a partner's perspective. You know, it's the Wildlife Conservation Society. There's universities that are involved like Florida International University and Cornell. And then when you get down in the Amazon, there's you know community groups, there's like 40 or 50 community groups or something. So it's just, just massive. There's a lot of people involved in that project. I went to um, Iquitos, Peru, which is a, a, it's a city in Peru that's completely cut off from the rest of the world from roads. The only way to get there is fly or go uh, on a boat down the Amazon river to get, get to Iquitos. And that, when I was there, there was maybe 150 people who were all part of the project that were at this conference um, as we were talking through the different things that we were going to do over the course of the years. Um, so that's probably the largest project in terms of people that I've, I've and organizations that I've ended up working on. Um, but I would say like Field Kid as a project on, on its, uh, of itself is the most ambitious because we've never really built something that we expect everybody to be able to use. Not only scientists or conservationists, but you know any of you students that are on this call right here or governments or you know uh, uh, farmers or uh, you know, all sorts of different people. And when you wanna build something that that many different people can use, it's a very complicated thing to make sure that you're building something that's that's both easy, but also very capable to kind of get the information that you need to do. All right, let's check in with our group in Mariposa, see if they have another question, we'll bring them up. There they are. Hello, uh, we just had a question about how the trackers exactly work. So you, uh, our student was wondering with the gorillas, he was wondering if you like uh, put a needle into the gorilla or what? Yeah, I mean, uh, the the all the tracking projects that we've worked on are non-invasive. So there's a couple ways people do it. Sometimes like there are the old trackers would actually kind of be embedded in. And so one of the, one of the ways that they still kind of do that to this day, which a lot of people are trying to get away from is with whales. They basically, those trackers have like little mini harpoons that are when they put it on the whale, it gets stuck inside the whale, but that hurts the whale. That's not the right way to do it. And so there's a lot of non-invasive ways. So they think, okay, how do we, we, how can we attach this tracker with some sort of glue that maybe will fall off after a while or straps. And so there, you know, with, with, with birds or, um, or like, elephants or lions and stuff they actually have like collars or backpacks that they put on these things that have the little tracker on there and the tracker will typically have like a like a little computer chip on it it'll have gps sometimes communications so that it'll send back the location of these things over time and then the tiny battery so these things and sometimes they'll have tiny solar panels so that they can last longer um but they'll either they'll either put it on with glue or or like straps or a little backpack onto these onto these animals. Um, but you always want to make sure there's a couple things you want to think about. One is like, if that's, if that tracker gets caught on something, is it going to hurt the animal? And so they usually have these breakaway things so that if, if a stick gets caught on the tracker, the animal doesn't just get stuck to that stick. Uh, and so, and then like putting trackers on things like gorillas is actually really hard because they're super intelligent. And if you put like a, say you were to put a, a wrist tracker on, they'll learn how to take it off or they'll like basically mess with it until it pops off. And so it's a very, it's a really hard thing to kind of try and uh, try and do correctly. 
All right. Um, very good question. So, uh, Shaw, as we wrap up, I want to take one more question, just a very quick one from YouTube. And they're wondering, uh, you know, you mentioned Python as a uh, coding to use, but uh, they're wondering a couple of people about a really easy, would that be your choice to start with a beginner or is there something else you'd recommend? Yeah, I mean, I, I think from a beginner, what I would do if I was starting as a beginner perspective is I would be, I would get a, my hands on a Raspberry Pi. Um, you could get this thing called the Raspberry Pi Zero that allow, you could, you could plug your monitor from your computer into it. It costs $5, so it's very, very inexpensive. It's basically a mini computer. Uh, and then there's there are tens of thousands of lessons online about how to do projects with your Raspberry Pi. And so you could learn start to learn Python and actually program Python on this little $5 computer. Um, and, and so that's where I would probably start. There's a, And then once you kind of get into that, you'll see all the different things you can do with a Raspberry Pi. If you want to build a Raspberry Pi tracker, you can get a little GPS chip that plugs into the Raspberry Pi. If you want to use it to turn on and off the lights in your house, you can do that. There's just the, the possibilities are endless. And so I would probably start with that because it just there's just so much there to, to understand. Uh, and it's so inexpensive to kind of get involved to start. All right. Well, Shah, I'm thrilled you were able to join us uh, and come into the lab today. Um, you know, talking about STEM careers doesn't get much better than talking to an engineer who who made his own career. So, um, you know, the kits you're making are amazing. The way you're able to open up the world um, with sensors, help people monitor their environments. It's it's pretty awesome. And getting that technology into the hands of students uh, with FuelKit, that's pretty darn exciting as well. Thank you. Yeah, no, thank, thank you everyone for, for listening to me today. Uh, it's been my pleasure to kind of share our story and the things we're trying to do. And hopefully one day um, I'll be hearing about the amazing work that some of you guys are doing. Awesome. Well, a huge shout out to our YouTube crew. Thanks for the great questions. Thank you to all of our camera classrooms and educators. As always, you're amazing. Uh, and we look forward to seeing you in more events this month and then next month when we kick all the men out in February and we host exclusively uh, Women in Science and Exploration. So thanks everyone for joining us. Shaw, great to see you as always. Uh, we're going to sign off for today. Thanks. Great seeing you too.